apologize. I apologize. So, so I was saying that uh, today we need to, to, of course, discuss things that has to do with uh, persons with disabilities generally as it concerns the, the electoral process. And of course, for the media, how can the media uh, uh, effectively and genuinely uh, promote disabilities around disability discourse? And how can we better help strengthen the media dimensions that challenges uh, exclusions and those that, of course, uh, uh, promote inclusions of persons with disabilities on an equal footing with those without disabilities? So these are some of the discourse we'll be having today. And to do justice to this, let me quickly run through the agenda. Uh, first, I welcome my president, the acting president of the Joint National Association of Persons with Disability. That is Mr. Osman A. Abdullahi. You are very welcome, sir. I can see him somewhere. And of course, uh, we'll mention, uh, we we'll welcome is the director of Makato Foundation Africa. You're very welcome, sir. Nice to meet me. See you again. And of course, after that, we welcome Mr. Clement Wanko. Uh, the Social Direct Policy and Legal Advocacy Center, FLAC, who is our partner on this. And of course, uh, after that, uh, we welcome you. Please kindly unmute yourself when you come into the meeting. Please mute yourself when you come into the meeting. Thank you. Media colleagues, thank you so much. Admin, please mute. Thank you. Admin, please mute. Thank you. Thank you. So then after that, thank you, admin. Uh, right after that. Uh, we call on the outgoing president of Journal Pid, who is now moved to the supply side. Uh, that's Madam Mekaite Umo uh, to discuss about disability data gathering and evidence based reporting in elections. And of course, after that, we call on the, Madam Lois Alta, a colleague, to discuss about accountability and social inclusion demands of persons with disabilities in elections. And of course, we end with uh, Mr. Adam Wishaku, who is the president of Nigeria Association of the Blind to discuss the dimensions uh, within the disability movement. So thank you everyone, we welcome you. I now call upon uh, the active president of Junapi, uh, Mr. Osman Abdullahi. Please sir, could you help us with the welcome remarks? You're welcome, sir. Uh, Mr. President. Mr. President. Okay, okay. Um, I'm not sure he was here earlier. Uh, we'll call on uh, Dr. Kole Shetima for his opening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ade Tunde, and good morning. Uh, good morning, all, sir. Good morning, all participants. And uh, you're yeah, welcome to the... Um, Hello, sir. Could you please unmute yourself? Thank you, sir. Sorry about that. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I was saying that, uh, first of all, to thank uh, uh, Jonathan and uh, um, Clark for organizing this uh, event, um, an event that the Makata Foundation is very happy to support as part of our work around elections and accountability in Nigeria. And uh, we are supporting this work because um, we believe that um, you know uh, inc an inclusive uh, election, uh, which is uh, anchored on bringing together, bringing all the voices of uh, people who are excluded in our electoral process uh, to be part of the conversation, um, is so significant and so very important process. Um, the foundation has a Hello, sir. Can you hear us? Sorry, I don't know why I get uh, muted. muted. 
Yeah, I don't know whether um, my computer Thank does you, that <laughs> automatically or somebody somewhere. Um, Thank you, sir. Okay. So I think somebody says somebody somewhere is mute all. So maybe the person can also. Um, yes, sir. Uh, that that will be addressed immediately. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm not sure what you have heard, but I was just saying that uh, our support towards inclusive politics is very very important uh, because we believe that um, all voices must be heard in our electoral process. In fact, is one of the basis for accountability in our system. Because you know, we want an electoral process, we want a system, we want a governance structure that is accountable to all citizens. And all citizens include people who we usually don't um, recognize them as part of the process, uh, even if probably they are in the majority. Uh, and, and, and because of that, I think that we are supporting Clark uh, to work on the issue around elections and, uh, and, and social inclusion. Uh, because we believe that uh, it's very important to bring voices of so many uh, array of people who are hit as or not hard into this electoral process. Um, at least we are happy that uh, INEC has created this. Uh, Hello, sir. Yeah, somebody is keep on unmuting us, muting us. So that is the problem we have. Uh, okay, so maybe, so, and I don't know where uh, you stopped hearing me, but I was saying that we are excited that uh, INEC has created a department on gender and inclusion. Uh, we think that it's very important for, for us to ensure that uh, the electoral body itself is very conscious and very uh, aware of this very important issue. And hopefully it will also, um, encourage uh, the political parties and all our electoral processes to be very conscious of the importance of um, uh, social inclusion in the work that we do. Um, we at the MacArthur Foundation, uh, we take this very, uh, very important because it's anchored on our idea around uh, gender and social inclusion. Uh, we are hoping that uh, we will contribute our own uh, quota towards ensuring that the uh, electoral process in the electoral system, but also in terms of the electoral system itself. You know, how do we ensure that this um, the system is very sensitive to the needs of different persons in our society who may have different needs and who I believe, we believe that uh, should also be taken into consideration. We are designing our own uh, processes, uh, both in terms of by the political parties, but also by the election management body, but also um, the funding agencies who are also supporting um, those things. Uh, I think that uh, for the funding agencies, I think by raising these issues as very important issues, is one way in which we will um, elevate this conversation and to ensure that uh, people, uh, that they put their, their money where their mouth is and ensuring that you know, those kinds of ideas are supported uh, System that we do, um, we hope that we will be able to ensure that you know, our electoral system will become more inclusive, um, more sensitive to uh, the challenges that people are uh, facing. So uh, let me uh, thank uh, all the people who have joined us from different parts of the country uh, to this occasion. I see people who have joined from, I would say, all parts of the country. Uh, because this is a very yes. <laughs> issue that all of us, I think, are very passionate about. And uh, I wish you the best. Um, I may not be able to stay too long. I don't Thank know whether so my much, colleague, uh, I mean, a Sally, who would be able to stay longer than myself, but I'm sure that um, she is always there to support the work that as well. So thank you very much, uh, Timde. Thank you so much, sir, for that very wonderful opening statement. And of course, we look forward to uh, the Makato's uh, support in ensuring that the system uh, is, is large enough and enabling enough to, to uh, pause, uh, effectively advance the participation of everyone, irrespective of the disability type or mode in the society. Thank you so very much, sir. Um, I don't know if uh, the active president is here now uh, for his welcome remarks. Mr. President, are you there? 
Otherwise, I will go straight uh, to uh, Mr. Clement Uwako. Thank you very much, sir, and good morning, sir. If you're there, kindly unmute. Mr. Clement. Okay, so. Morning. Hello, sir. I hear you. Good morning. And, Good morning, uh, sir. Thank you for inviting me to participate in, um, in this meeting. I am also trying to um, get um, my camera to come on. But um, good morning and uh, thank you uh, for uh, organizing this very important meeting. Um, also, on behalf of Black, to uh, thank um, Dr. Kole Shetima and the Makan Foundation for uh, supporting this very uh, important initiative. Uh, Dr. Shetima had talked uh, to the efforts that have been made with respect to uh, improving um, the electoral system. And for all of us who are involved in elections, it is uh, a matter of, um, of um, interest uh, to us to see how um, electoral process can be very inclusive. Uh, recent conversations about the uh, legal framework for elections in Nigeria have included how to take care of the concerns of persons living with disability. Uh, but even more importantly, how do we uh, ensure that the legal instruments and uh, the legislative instruments for oversighting the application of laws and the application of policies by the electoral commission and stakeholders responsible for elections uh, takes into cognizance the important need that um, uh, needs to take care of, um, of persons living with disability. In the recent conversations uh, around the passage of the a new electoral law for Nigeria. Uh, it was a conversation, how do you ensure that politics and uh, information around elections enable uh, for persons living with disability to participate very effectively. Uh, some of us who were in the conversations with the committees um, on, electoral, um, uh, on the electoral bill, and who attended the meetings were quite uh, pleased with a lot of the information supplied by uh, groups from Jonah Pete and indeed from several other uh, organizations working on disability issues. Information that um, has helped in a lot of ways to clarify um, the, the conversations. Um, one of the provisions in, in the new electoral bill that is um, hopefully going to be passed by the National Assembly in the coming week, um, talks to section or clause 54 uh, about visually impaired and incapacitated voters. Um, if, we, if, if we look back to what was in that um, law, um, it talked about the commission, which is INEC, um, it says that the commission may take reasonable steps to ensure that persons living with disabilities, special needs, and vulnerable persons are assisted at the polling place by provision of suitable means of communication, such as braille, large embossed print or electronic devices, or sign language interpretation, or off-site voting in appropriate cases. Um, a lot of the groups working, and that includes Jonah Pitt, working on disability issues, working on inclusion issues, had argued that the word may, that the commission may take reasonable steps, does not provide a compelling uh, factor for INEC to compulsorily take this into account. And advocacy by uh, groups helped to change this such that um, uh, once the law is passed in the coming week, 
Uh, it is no longer a discretionary issue with the commission. It will be a matter of requirement that um, the commission shall, uh, which is the word that replaced me, <laughs> shall take every step uh, to ensure that um, access to polling units by persons living with disabilities uh, is, is taken care of. I think that for all of us, this is really uh, a very good progress. And uh, looking even beyond that, um, implementation of policies, implementation of laws, which is a whole conversation around oversight. Uh, oversight, of course, is usually related to uh, the legislature being able to carry out that role. But for us in uh, working in the civic space, working um, as organizations on disability issues, uh, our responsibility to follow up on oversight, provide information to whether it's a legislative body that has oversight over INEC, and that oversight is usually very, um, very narrowly defined because of the important need for INEC to be independent. Uh, but beyond that, uh, our ability to monitor what is going on is so very key. And that would feed into the legislative committees. But also, we know that INEC now, uh, as Dr. Kole Shatima has stated, uh, has a gender inclusion department. department. And um, from uh, the work that Plaque uh, is doing with Jonah Pid, uh, is also uh, already started doing with this particular unit in INEC or department in INEC. It means that a whole lot of what we observe around elections affecting persons with disability uh, will need to uh, feed into that particular department. Uh, and we did have myself and uh, Agyan Ponyema, who is uh, directly uh, implementing this project. We did have a meeting with uh, the yes. INEC National Commissioner, uh, Mr. Ogumola, um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, as well as the head of um, that uh, particular unit, Mrs. Obidigbo, to look at how um, we can work with that department. And we really are very grateful to the Mercado Foundation uh, that department is very much open uh, to engagements, to working with us and um, also with civil society generally on implementing uh, policies that impact on persons with disabilities. So my sense and hope is that um, we can uh, take what we can, and, and I think this meeting is essentially, is especially very helpful and useful to identifying key concerns uh, beyond this meeting, whatever con other concerns we have, uh, this would be a very important unit to take forward uh, some of those concerns. We also did have meetings with INEC uh, national, uh, INEC chairman on, on the subject, and he has very repeatedly um, specifically stated his uh, concern about issues of concern to persons living with disability and very, very much open. Uh, in his words, to engage in and to improve in uh, conditions around elections uh, to improve the uh, issues that are raised or to address the issues that are raised by persons uh, living with a disability. I'm not quite sure how much more I, I can speak. Uh, <laughs> so I'm Hello, not quite sir. sure how much more I can speak. Yeah. You, you uh, have two more minutes, sir. <laughs> Thank you for your kindness. <laughs> but um, I must say that um, um, the fact that um, the issues affecting persons living with disability is now in the front burner. Uh, thanks a lot to, to Mercado Foundation for this and to Dr. Kole Shatima. And, and I see that Amina Saleh is also in the room. Uh, thank you so much for all of the support that uh, the Mercado Foundation continues to give. Uh, and for Jonah Pid, um, congratulations to the acting president. I'm looking forward to uh, listening to him, hopefully before this meeting is over. Uh, but certainly working together with Jonah Pid and uh, with support of the Mercado Foundation, we're hoping that uh, ahead of the next general elections, several of the issues of concern to persons living with disability uh, would be something that we would have uh, tackled and brought forward for uh, INEC, the um, election um, management body to implement in the course of its elections. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, sir, for that very wonderful um,
to do justice to how to monitor and assess every aspect and every element that has to do with persons with disabilities uh, uh, within the electoral process than uh, Madam uh, Kaite Umo, uh, the, the current uh, country director of CBM Global, the outgoing president of Jonah Pitt and uh, Mama Disability uh, herself. So Madam Kaite, welcome. Uh, welcome to today's meeting. If you can hear me, please unmute. If you can yes, hear can me, you hear me? Unmute. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Mav. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you so very much, Tunde. And uh, I want to greet Dr. Kola Shatima, if he's still there. Um, Dr. Amina Saliu, um, Mr. Clement Mwakwa. I thank you so much for putting this together, Jonathan, and it's only to reconnect with my primary community. So um, when I got the invite, I was asked to speak on disability data gathering and evidence-based reporting in elections. And so I'm meant to understand that this is a media, Pali. And so we will be gisting. <laughs> we just be gisting. There's nothing new that I need to tell you that you have not heard. But I think what we constantly be thinking of the approach. How do we unpack and present it in a way that it will be relevant to? If we are going to be looking at disability data gathering and evidence-based reporting, you cannot be gathering data or reporting against something you have no knowledge about or know nothing about or have a misconception uh, about. So um, I have just put together some kind of point here, uh, which has to do with how we need to take this forward. Um, admin, please, can you mute this person playing this music, please? It's a huge distraction to this meeting. Can you mute this person? Thank you. All right, then. So I, I was just thinking, I told you we are going to be gisting. There's nothing new I'm going to be talking that you have not heard, but we need to change our approach uh, in doing these things. And I was just saying earlier that you cannot be reporting or gathering data uh, on a subject that you know nothing about or very little knowledge or misconstrue in your beliefs about that particular subject matter. So I'm always, when I'm asked to speak like this, I like to contextualize uh, the subject matter so that we can all be on the same page as we move. So if it's going to be about disability data gathering and uh, reporting, it, it is important to remind ourselves what disability, uh, what disability is. So we need to really contextualize and understand how disability is defined and how it's understood and how it could be addressed. So once we have that clarity, it's not easy for us to put in the building blocks as it is. So I, I'm not going to manufacture what disability is all about. We will quickly go to a document which is very popular and available to us. And that has to do with, you know, Article one of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, which clearly says that um, disability is all about people who have impairment. So again, you are going to be gathering data. You need to understand the kind of data you are gathering, the instrument that you use in gathering data, what is the information about the people you are trying to gather this data about. So he's saying that disability itself, generally if I paraphrase, if I paraphrase is all about people who have impairment. But the argument here is that impairment is not just enough to stop our, uh, to stop our participation. Impairment cannot bring about restricted participation as it were. And there's something that is causing that uh, exclusion, which is why we all gathered here. We are shouting inclusion because there's exclusion. So the root cause of exclusion is because people have um, impairment and they are trying to participate 
and they are meeting different kinds of barrier that is stopping them from participating. So if you are going to be gathering data, it is not just about the people who have impairment, but it's going to be the interaction between those who have impairment and the kind of barriers that they face trying to participate. And so we look at the kinds of impairment, we say those who have long-term physical, you know, intellectual or sensory impairment. So in our communities, there's this diverse set of people and some have sensory impairment, some physical impairment. So, but we are very used to the physical impairment and we're living at the invisible uh, um, impairment as it were. That they have impairment, that's fine, it's, it's not a problem. But there's this set of people who have this impairment are trying to participate and they are constantly meeting with some kind of barriers and obstacles that is stopping them from participating. So if you are going to be gathering data, you're going to be looking at those who have impairment and the kind of barriers that they meet that is stopping them from participating. So the, the, if that is understood, so it's not like I'm blind, so it's my problem and so I can't uh, participate. It's like, yes, I'm blind. And so what are the barriers that as a blind person will be meeting in trying to participate in elections and all of that? Those are the indices that you look at for so that when you are gathering your data, you are gathering from an informed you know, perspective. So it will not be, what, what in, in trying to gather this data, what exactly will you be looking at for? What are, will you be looking at for? And so how will you take this uh, you know, um, forward in trying to gather the data? But yet again, we are guided. Remember disability as it is, yes, we, we have impairment. Yes, there's a barrier, but yes, we need to unpack those barriers so it will help us to understand how to gather this data. So what are the kinds of barriers that people with disability may face as they try to participate in elections? That could be um, the physical barrier. They could also face um, the environmental barrier. They could face communication you know, barriers and they could also face you know, uh, some kind of um, legal barriers or institutional barriers and all of those. So if a person with an impairment tries to assess a pulling booth and maybe those, that, that person with a physical impairment and is meeting some kinds of rough terrain or maybe steps or where the ballot box is so high and is trying to cast his or her ballot and meeting those rough steps, then this is a person who has physical disability and those steps are the barriers. And those are the, that is a step that is stopping that person from casting his or her ballot. So when you are reporting, what will you be reporting? Will you be reporting that, oh, you saw one person pair of clutches going to vote, so what? So your reporting pattern will now be, okay, there's this person who is a wheelchair rider or uses a pair of clutches and could not access the ballot box or sign up to franchise. Why? Because there were these steps that he could not surmount and all of that or could not climb over. So when you are reporting that kind of real evidence-based kind of reporting, you are drawing the attention to a solution. Because if there's one experience that I'm sorry to say my media colleagues I don't like, is that you leave the, the substance and you focus on something that may not really bring about a good advocacy or that may, bring up, that may not bring about the change that we desire. So if you went to the field and you're trying to gather data, you saw people riding on a wheelchair and your camera lens is just on our uh, mobility appliances or uh, you know, aid, and you're capturing it and say people with disability went to cast the, you've not done anything. So once you understood the barriers that, that each and every cluster members or in, impairment, uh, people with impairment will face, that will quickly allow you to have a very clean you know, kind of uh, reporting. So you're gathering data. How many persons with disabilities, how many people with physical disability did you send the pulling booth? And how many were able to cast their ballot in a very, in a very accessible, in an accessible environment? So if you're looking, for instance, now at the legal um, institutional barriers, there could be laws and policies that will stop people from um, people with intellectual disabilities from actually participating in election. And there's a question about legal capacity. That issues about legal capacity is that, oh, this is person is, is not intellectually sound. How will he be able to know alphabet letters or where to cast and all of that? So that kind of institutional barriers could also stop people with intellectual disabilities from participating. So your, your lens would be, let me look at, is there anybody 
who is um, of the intellectual disability or there's another class of psychosocial disability that have been so stigmatized that they're participating in this election. So those will just be the lens that you'll be you know, running with. But in doing this, you need to take your mind back to Article 31, Paragraph 2 of the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disability. So that the information collected in accordance with this article shall not be desegregated into you know, different segments. And it's not like, okay, people with disability went. So how, what kind of cluster did they belong? And what was the challenges that they went through? So I have just 10 minutes to speak, but I would like you to just go to read Article 31 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. That could just help you to understand what it says about data gathering and when it comes to disability uh, issue. So if you're look, now that if, if you're looking at gathering and you want to report in a very nice way that would be interesting, please keep your eyes on the impairment and also keep your eyes on what will be stopping you know persons with disability or that what will stand like a barrier for allowing them to uh, you know assess. Then what instrument are you taking to the field? You're a journalist, you have a checklist. What kind of checklist? Because it's all of this information that will prepare you, you know, very well to go to the, to the field. Are you going the kind of checklist? Is it a kind of disability specific checklist? Or is it the international election observation mission checklist? And we could do this both ways. So if you have the international election observation mission checklist, you could now incorporate the disability component into which could be it. And that becomes like a cross-cutting kind of a thing. So it's mainstreaming into that. Or you want to work with DPOs, I mean, organizations like Genapid and other disability-led organizations to develop a specific tool, a checklist that you will take to the list and um, to the field that will enable you, you know, benchmark or uh, tick. It's easier for you to do that than to write long sentences and just look at it. And so that will help you to, collect enough data as to the um, barriers that you'll be seeing on the election day and how that, that can be remedied. And so that kind of um, tool is a standalone tool. You could talk to Janapit or um, any other group or meet Plag and Makato to help you see how they can put that together. It's a specific checklist that is a standalone. It's all disability assets that you'll be looking you know, at. So when, when you have seen that, you now keep your eyes on uh, election access. So everything that will be happening that day is election access. And this you know, kind of provides for a kind of specific context where you can keep your eyes on the barriers as well as, you know, um, keep your eyes on the barriers as well as the impairments. So when you cite an impairment, the next thing that should come to your mind is barriers. So when you match impairments and barriers, that will now help you to collect your data. So when you are collecting your data, you look at the barrier. So what is the barrier? What data are you going to be collecting? Is it going to be relating to attitudinal barriers? So what kind of barriers would we see in attitude? Would it have been that a person with disability just got there, was snubbed? or was like, ah, what did you come to do? You should have been at home now. Uh -uh. Why did you disturb yourself? It does like those kind of tiny, tiny, you know, subtle kind of uh, uh, discrimination or in attitude. That's what you've been looking at for. So you're also going to be looking at the invisible, you know, barriers as it were. Did you see anyone with a psychosocial disability that, that has been undermined or someone with an intellectual disability that has not been attended to? Did you see a deaf person just standing in terms of reasonable accommodation and all of that? How many persons with disability the observers did you notice? Because it's not expected that we even observe. It's like we shouldn't trouble ourselves so much. We should just be, you know, at home and not, you know, bother. In all of this, we have a mandate. Disability issue is a human rights issue. So we are not saying we want to beg to participate. No, we are saying that we are part of this community entitled to whatever rights anybody has, including rights to political participation. And Article 9 of the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disability spelled this very well. And if you look at part four of the Discrimination Against Persons with Disability Prohibition Act 2018, part four subsection and section 30 also spells it that. So we are here, we want to participate. So it's not as if you are trying to include us, no. We make up the number. If you say we are 200 million in Nigeria, 
we are about over 15 percent so it's not an afterthought so disability is no longer an afterthought and we have changed the, the, the paradigm has shifted so much that it's not about welfareism again it's all about human rights based approach that is what we are looking at now so when you look at it you understand that these are persons with disability and they are nigerians they are entitled to whatever rights they have to have. that would give a liberated mind to go you know uh, and assess all of this um so when you put all of these together it will now give you a clear understanding of the data you need to collect like i said in the in my opening uh, remark that you cannot collect the data against something you don't understand so i want to believe that with just this few communication or this interaction where i don't know how much time i have left that that if there's anything you need to unlearn very fast is that persons with disability have impairment and impairment is not just enough to bring about part, uh, participation restriction, and it is the barriers that they have faced. So all those that you have known about were ferrism, let's pity them, they came here, please, it's good that you try to unlearn those very fast and begin to learn the new paradigm shift which is you know, situated and the human rights uh, approach. So I, I'm, I'm still here. Um, there are a lot I need to talk about, but I know time is fast spent because it's supposed to end by yeah. 11. <laughs> And if you have any other question as uh, as a follow-up to this um, uh, my um, conversation with you, I'm still very much around to respond. But I just hope that we've been able to learn some new things and unlearn those very ones that were not helpful. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, Madam Ekaite, for that very explosive and, um, uh, of course, evidence-driven contributions to this uh, conversation. And of course, uh, it was clearly stated, uh, she premised most of our statements on the base of we have an evidence base or using evidence based lens to media reportage that should lead to desired change in relations to the participation of persons with disabilities in elections. So thank you so very much, Sorry. Ma. Again, Madam Lois Alta. Are you there? Madam Lois Alta, are you there? Lois Alta will take us to. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah, many thanks to. MacArthur Foundation for supporting this brilliant initiative from Jonah Pitt. And we're also proud of the work FLAC is doing with organizations of persons with disabilities. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about accountability and social inclusion demands of persons with disabilities in elections. Yes, Article 29 of the United Nations Convention of the Right of Persons with Disabilities talks about the right of persons with disabilities to participate and to be included in elections. Can you hear me now? Okay. So we are very proud of the work INEC is doing. Yesterday, the update they posted about the continuous workers registration has shown that persons with disabilities are participating. Out of the 1,509,989 people that registered so far, 15,903 are persons with disabilities. In 2018 and 2019, we were 
proudly supported by MacArthur Foundation on institutional institutionalized institutionalizing anti-corruption and accountability in Nigeria through inclusive electoral processes. And some of the activities we did were national dialogues, focus group discussions, jingles, media palettes, radio talk shows, advocacy visits and so on in the six geopolitical zones. I'm so proud to mention that from this advocacy activities, <clears throat> we were able to, hello Tinde. Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. INEC now has inclusivity and gender department. They have a national policy on disability. And some real ballot papers were deployed at various polling units during the 2019 election. I'm also proud of the work Inclusive Friends. I'm so proud of the work Inclusive Friends Association are doing. Presently, they are in Anambra and they have deployed 200 observers. Hello, Tunde. Please go ahead, we can hear you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Inclusive Friends have deployed 200 observers in the Anambra governorship elections. This has shown that government are beginning to give attention to persons with disabilities. They are listening to us. And we're also proud of development partners for supporting organizations of persons with disabilities to be able to record some milestones, achievements on inclusive elections. Having said that, I have some few recommendations on how to ensure in our elections. So pre-electoral period, what we need to put in place before elections, we need to assess specific disability lens. We also need to remove or reform outright barriers to voting and increase overall accessibility. And another important action that we need to take is to make sure that inclusive election administration with disability lens in all areas of preparations are included during elections what do we need to put in place We need to empower persons with disabilities during the nomination process to viable candidates, qualified candidates, those in politics, those that, those that are interested 
in creating change by being elected. We need to encourage them by voting for them. We also uh, need to assist uh, disabled people organizations in securing election pledges from candidates and political parties to increase awareness of advocacy initiatives and constituent consent. Madam Lois, please you have, yes. Uh, yes, like a minute or two. Thank you. Okay. Another action that we need to take to ensure elections are inclusive is the polling unit. Are they accessible to those in wheelchairs and those on crutches for the visually impaired? Can they vote independently using braille ballot papers? And for those that are hearing impaired, are there sign language interpreters at our various polling units? These are very sensitive questions that we need to ask ourselves. We need to hold government accountable to be able to achieve inclusive elections. And after elections, what do we do? We need to impose penalties when accessibility standards are not followed. We also need to review process to capture lessons learned and assess the impact of actions taken to increase access and inclusivity pre-elections and during elections. And another point is to ensure accessibility of government institutions. And the last but not the least, is legislations. We need to keep talking about it. We need to keep advocating for inclusive legislations. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity and do have a good day. Thank you so very much, uh, Madam Lois, for that uh, fantastic perspective to um, social inclusion and, of course, uh, the demand on accountability. Of course, one thing was very clear, of course, in Nigeria, in times of laws and policies, we have them. But in times of adhering to such laws, we need to be deliberate in imposing uh, penalties so that we can hold our state actors and non-state actors accountable, especially within the context of uh, persons uh, with disabilities. Of course, uh, our time is fast spent. I would like to straight away invite Mr. Adamo Ishaku, the president of, of Nigeria Association of the Blind, um, to just give us a chat about dimensions of disabilities and the priorities in elections. Mr. Adamo, you can you hear me please on mute? Yes, uh, Mr. Tunde, good morning and good morning everybody. Good morning, sir. Please yes, thank you for giving me the opportunity and thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, um, I would like to speak for five minutes already, uh, Madam. Thank you, sir. Uh, <laughs> um, 
president um, that is a CD has already spoke extensively on my topic. So <laughs> he has made the work easier, very much easier for me, which I, I truly appreciate. <laughs> so I am going to uh, speak very briefly and the role of the media uh, in that. And um, but before I do just that, uh, permit me to thank uh, um, Afatu Foundation and John Pitt National for organizing this wonderful um, uh, session. It's quite interesting and um, it's quite encouraging. It is something that uh, we expect to have from time to time uh, yes. to keep on uh, talking to uh, to the media people because of their critical role um, in setting so many agendas uh, in our society. Um, having said that, I would like to. I'm coming, sorry. Um, my screen is misbehaving. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So um, the role of the media um, is very critical in our, in our society uh, because they set agenda uh, of a national discourse and they make issue to be very much prominent or to make issue to be less important, depending on how uh, the media uh, look at the particular issue uh, in the society. So that is why when it comes to disability issue, uh, we see the role of the media as a very critical role they play because they are very critical stakeholders. And in political uh, or in um, uh, communication, uh, the media, they are setting what we call uh, agenda, framing the agenda of anything on how they want it and how they want uh, the public uh, to look at it. So the same thing apply uh, to the disability issues uh, in, this, uh, in this context, particularly when it comes to election, when it comes to any matters uh, of national importance. So the role of media over the years uh, in regard to persons with disability has been uh, framed in such a way that um, as Modern Kaite put it, uh, they put it uh, in a kind of a medical or charity uh, perspective uh, for a person with disability. If uh, the media want to look at disability, uh, sometimes uh, they are looking at issues of charity or they are looking of somebody with a disability that has made great accomplishment and they want to use that to encourage non-disabled people uh, in the society. So they are just like looking at somebody, okay, who has made it and they okay come let's interview you what happened to you and how did you get here and then they will sell out the uh, the news uh, to other people and the aim is to encourage uh, the general public which is good in that sense but there is not uh, there is uh, much need to be done uh, in that uh, in that regard because uh, it's quite so many issues challenges and barriers affecting a person with disability and the, and the media need to do more uh, to understand uh, these issues. So um, there are three issues I would like to talk about uh, to that issue, uh, uh, to this. So number one, I think the, the media need to understand the concept and the phenomena of disability from the right base model as previously uh, been speaking about. So what is uh, disability from the right base issue? And then how can they be able to report issues of disability from the rights based perspective without making the issue to be like um, it's a charity is being, uh, being appealing like a sympathetic issue. I uh, try to reduce it uh, to a level that policymakers and other duty bearers will, will feel as if it's a burden to them and they just need to do maybe a kind of piecemeal approach uh, to the issue. So the media need to make these people, particularly the, the duty bearers to understand disability issue is, is a right-based issue and they need, it is their duty to do it, not like as if it is inconveniencing them or they just have to do it like a way of appealing to their conscience or something like that. No, it's, an, um, it's, a, it's a legal binding issue that they have to do it um, by doing that, they are also fulfilling uh, the duty that they are there to serve uh, for the generality of the public, which a person with disability is also part. And secondly, 
and understanding the dimension of disability. The media need to understand uh, the dimension of disability. I think um, Mother Lois and uh, Mother Ikai to talk about that, but what I just want to say uh, is that um, disability is not an, uh, a homogeneous uh, 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 society. We, uh, we are quite diverse from visually impaired, hearing impaired, those with mobility impairment, those with uh, intellectual disability, those with albinism, and a whole lot of issues. And all of us, we have our own differences, we have our own needs, and we have our own way of, um, or the barriers that um, we are facing in the society. So the, the media need to put that issues into perspective. And we can do that um, by building the capacity of the media people, just the way we are talking today, try to interact with them, show them this is what the visually impaired are facing the site when it comes to election. Is it um, going to the rally uh, that is very crowded? You know, the way our politicians are putting, uh, doing conductor rally these days, very crowded with talks everywhere and nobody can, will be willing to spend five minutes in that environment. Somebody like uh, with a visual impairment a very crowded and very noisy, uh, giving the opportunity to participate uh, to a politician. And the politician will be complaining that we don't attend rally, we don't attend political issues because they, the place and the, the setting is not just right for us to go there, to, to stay, and even to participate the way they, they put it. And the way they are running up and down, what's about somebody on the wheelchair? Can he be able to participate in those in, in, in those political rally? So these are issues that when are properly put in perspective, I think patients and other duty bearers, I make and other people will want so that everybody will be able to participate uh, in such places. It's not only on the election day, even before election, before the proposed election, there are a lot of things that are happening in the electoral process. So it's a process beginning with either with voters registration, campaign rallies. It's a whole lot of process as already stated by uh, the uh, country director of um, of my MacArthur Foundation. I think so we need to put all this in perspective. The legal issue, do the people from the disability that they can be able to make a reference where reporting disability issues. What about the United Nations Convention of Persons with Disability? What about the African um, um, okay. Charter that speak uh, to persons with disability? What about the National Disability Act? What about the constitutional <laughs> provision that talks about uh, um, uh, removing discrimination and other issues? So these are legal instruments that I, I am very sure that when uh, uh, people from the media understand them, and during their reporting and during their interaction, they can be able to make a reference to those things because most of the duty bearers and policy makers do not know that this thing exists, do not know mm -hmm. that we have all this right enshrined in most of these international, regional, and national uh, instruments that can be made reference. They were thinking mm -hmm. that, okay, we are only pleading that we should be included. So when, when media uh, understand this thing and uh, make reference, For instance, I think it will go a long way. So, there is any question, I will be here to the end of the year. Thank you so very yeah. much. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, you, yeah. you spent your 10 minutes yeah. actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much, sir, for your contribution. Uh, it was clearly stated that, of course, um, state actors and non state actors, uh, including the media, must understand the principles that surround some of these conventions the laws that advances the lives of persons with disabilities generally. Otherwise, we might be projecting these issues very wrongly. And of course, unfortunately, probably reinforcing the discriminations and marginalization. On this note, I want to thank everybody. Um, the floor will be open for five minutes. I apologize. We are uh, behind schedule already for questions. If you have any or contributions at this time, if you have questions or contributions, kindly raise your hands. Or you could just drop it in the chat box. Contributions or questions.
So while we wait, I want to ask if the active president is back. Um, Mr. Tunde, I think Mr. somebody president. put a, a question from the chat box, if you can look at it. Okay, I'm going there. Okay. Will the persons with disability, sorry, I think this is a question from Adizat Usman. Will the persons with disability polling unit be different? I don't know which is it's the question directed to specifically. Madam Aikaito, if you are there. Yes, a very interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> So it means we, we are, will our community be different? Will our market be different? <laughs> we are part of this society. It's not going to be different. It's just like, again, isolating us or pushing us to the bushes or all of that. We won't have separate pulling boots for persons with disability. And how will you do that? How will you do that if you are to take maybe the data, maybe the statistics of a community, how many persons with disability will be in that community and how many pulling boots can you build according to impairment type? We are part of this society, part of the community, and we will not have a different place. So what we are saying here is that look at the impairment, look at the barriers, and in trying to remove those barriers, you create accessible pulling uh, you know, units, so station or whatever. So there's not going to be um, a separate pulling unit. Perhaps you heard me talk about a standalone thematic issue and a cross-cutting issue. In this case, it is not that kind of standalone, I mean, segregation. That will lead to segregation. It's going to be the same pulling booth, um, pulling unit or pulling station, but we'll just take issues of access into consideration while designing such a pulling station. Thank you. So I think there's a follow-up question from her that when and how will they be trained on how to cast their votes? <laughs> and I think by <laughs> my colleague wants to take that said so I don't be the only one speaking. Okay. Any other person, if otherwise. Mr. Adamu, do you want to take that? Yeah, what is the question says? The follow-up question. Okay, so that how and when we persons with disabilities we trade to cast the vote? Well, I don't think if um, the only thing we need as um, firstly the, the, the pooling unit you know, to make accessible, um, and um, that has been uh, mentioned, I think, in so many documents of INEC, um, particularly uh, the, their framework for action on the participation of persons with disability is well stated there. But I think, how can we be trained? We don't require any special training to cast our vote, uh, just yeah. like any other person. Once um, INEC is making uh, uh, voter education, they need to include a person that we have right to vote. Maybe the only section of people perhaps require training are uh, visually impaired because um, we have a different method of casting our vote. So maybe INEC should, uh, uh, can also de uh, devise a means on how we should understand uh, the ballot paper developed, or if, if it is a braille ballot paper, is a tactile, tactile ballot paper, or whatever form they want us uh, to use as a visually impaired, I think that uh, that one can be made uh, to the public earlier, and then INEC can use that through their uh, voters' education unit uh, to train uh, the visually impaired on how to adopt and use that on the election day. I think that is the only uh, difference. Thank you. Thank you so very much for that, sir. Uh, Tunde, if I may just add just a little here. Thank you so much, ma. Continuous I was just up. <laughs> yes, continuous voter education. I mean, it's still going to be December. We need to unpack. Considering the, 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 the peculiarity of our community, UNESCO says only 2% of us have been to school. So we need to unpack and in de delivering that kind of education. You know, that is when we take the disability component into consideration. Again, the twin track approach will come into play here. Whether we're going to do it as a cross-cutting issue, mixing with other civil society, doing the voters' education, or we're going to do standalone thematic issue where we put people with disability together, looking at the impairment type and the kind of kinds of challenge that they may have. It. And this, you know, unpacking and breaking down, simplifying that particular you know, education material to helping everyone understand because the training is not going to be a one size fits all approach. Imagine somebody with intellectual disability and you need to train on how to understand electoral matters. The approach is quite different 
uh, from every other. So my, um, um, you know, um, um, uh, contribution here will be let's unpack, let's use the twin track approach, and and then we can um, help people with disability and participate effectively in voters education. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, there's a contribution from Billy Kisu and saying it is important that we call on INEC to make provisions from the C640H to have data of persons with disabilities and it should be mandatory. Thank you so very much, Billy Kisu. Um, and of course, uh, in terms of um, uh, proceedings of this meeting and, and the call of the meeting, uh, I hope uh, we've been able to call uh, to raise the call, to raise the standard of storytelling around disability inclusion as concerns elections specifically. Uh, I know that we've seen some polls or a poll running. Uh, please, we urge you to, of course, um, participate in the poll. It will help us and guide, of course, our project designs at Jonopi. And of course, as we seek for support in some, some things like or components like capacity building, for instance, for, for our media colleagues. I think that, that has been one of the recurring statements at today's meeting. I don't know if we have any contributions. Um, Madam Amela Salu, she's still on. Could you please unmute Ma and add your voice before we round up? Uh, rather today, I, I really just wanted to, um, <laughs> to listen this morning. And I think it's been, um, an exceptional opportunity for me listening. Sorry, I'm trying to get my video up. I, I would like to thank the, the leadership of the um, because a lot of the time when we have this kind of conversation, people ask, where is the leadership? When they ask where's the leadership, it's not just about physical presence, it's also about intellectual presence and awareness of the issues. And having listened to the presentation today made by people from the community, and the ways in which the questions have been answered. I can even see my sister Hadiza Usman saying she's satisfied with the way the questions have been answered. I think that's a very, very good way to engage with the community. So I thank the leadership for being present because that's the way to make an advocacy process lead to change. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Plak. I'm not doing a vote of thanks, so it's because my brother can be dragged me. <laughs> you can as well do that. You've been seconded no, 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 by, no. by Dr. No, no. By, by Dr. Colin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd like to thank Plak because um, for their leadership. I mean, we listened to my brother, uh, Clem, earlier about the fact that we need to have a law. And when you have the Electoral Act properly amended, and there are clauses that demand access and participation in a way that is institutionalized. It's no longer dependent on the whims and caprices of anyone. And, and that's the purpose of having a disability commission um, to serve, if you will, as the pathfinder for every other space to be disability compliant and aware and responsive. And that you know, every other law should be able to follow that disability law 2019 which is consistent with the Constitution of Nigeria 1999 as amended. So it's, it's an honor um, for us at the MacArthur Foundation to be partnering with PLAG to work with Jonah Pitt. Now you heard my Africa director speak earlier, Dr. Koli Ahmed Shatima, and he affirmed the role that INEC itself is you know, confirming or um, they're ready to play by even having that department on gender equity and social inclusion. It's a very big start and so, Part of what we need to learn ourselves is how we engage with some of these governmental institutions and how what we bring to the table. Because a lot of the time we think um, government will not be responsive. You never know until you engage. And in there are people who also want change to happen. And so we ourselves must find the entry point and continue to push and continue to engage. My sister Eka talked about continued voter education on the side of government, on the side of our community. And final for me is to the media. I've seen about seven, eight media organizations represented here today, and this is supposed to be a media panel. I'd like to appeal to the media to not leave this conversation today without making a pledge to yourselves to better understand issues of disability, to better understand how you can use your various platforms to amplify the needs of human beings um, who are complete, because persons with disabilities are also human beings who are complete especially when you consider the fact that disability can happen to any one of us at any time in our lives. 
and that they are different forms of disabilities. No, but I'm not so visible. I'm muting my sister Habiba. I'm glad I have co-hosts right. Very good. <laughs> <Thank you>. so, <laughs> because I need to hear a commitment from the media. Uh, Tunde, if you have a few more minutes, I would like to hear the voices of all those from the media who are present. They are, we are all, the majority are from the media. Brilliant. So whether in the chat or whether physically speaking, how are you going to use your platform going forward? How are you going to step down what you've heard today to other platforms to be more responsive, to be more agile around issues that affect persons with disabilities? And then of course, there's always the December day um, for persons with disabilities, which is also important to begin to mark as a starting point. December 3rd, if I'm not mistaken, today. Yes, um, ma'am, that's correct. It's a date that we need to also bear in mind. It is round the corner, and we can begin to use that to expand the space for persons with disabilities. So on behalf of my um, Africa director, Dr. Kole Shetima, I would like to thank you all, Flag Dinopic, all colleagues on the floor, for the opportunity of participating and of listening to you today. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your morning and afternoon. You know, thank you so very much, Mark, for that uh, uh, fantastic contribution to, to, the, to the discourse uh, on the table. Uh, on this note, uh, unfortunately, the acting president of Junapid, um, of course, is, is, is having challenges with erratic uh, network. It, it can't be able to join us today. But of course, we've done fantastically in terms of contributing to the discourse this day. Uh, yes, there are comments in the chat box, and of course, um, someone mentioned that it's Jonapid mainly for people with disabilities. This is Jonapid. Jonapid is for everyone, but of course, in times of the core of Jonapid, Jonapid advances the lives of persons with disabilities. It is the umbrella body of persons with disabilities in Nigeria. And as someone once said, you can't be the rich. So this is Jonapid. As far as uh, we are concerned, we are here to enable the space for everyone. We have actors within the movement and outside the movement. And again, as uh, I think Madam Ekaiti mentioned earlier, it's not all disabilities that are visible. And I think the team for December 3rd is that not all. There are a lot of invisible disabilities that the media especially needs to understand that, that it's not all wheelchair riders or someone that is blind and all that, that you only attribute disability uh, into. So in aspect of elections, diversity, uh, the dimensions that needs to be considered must be deliberately pushed and advanced. So this is some of the discourse that we brought to for today. I would like to thank everyone for participating today Today's on elections. We have other things that are in the post that we shall be bringing to your food store. And in terms of the commitments, of course, we have your contacts. We would, we would share, of course, the documents to, have, of course, collect your commitment and we'll probably take up from there in terms of how we engage with the media, especially as it concerns capacity building in terms of what a disability discourse and inclusion means to us and for everybody at the society at large. At this point, I would like to say thank you very much for today. And we look forward to having you and engaging with you in the not too far future. Thank you everyone for today. This is bye for now.